the first thing you're going to hear me say when we unpause the recording is Michael. Um, let me just gather my thoughts for a second here. Right, yes. So the first thing you're going to hear me say when we <laughs> start, uh, when, I st when we unpause the recording is that uh, we are recording and anybody who doesn't want to be recorded should leave. We're recording. Oh, we aren't recording. Okay, <laughs> fair enough. So you've just heard me say it. Uh, but we hope you don't leave. Uh, but uh, we, we need to let you know that we are recording to uh, comply with our local privacy regulations at uh, OCAD University where we are sitting today, or some of us are sitting today. So uh, good afternoon, good evening, good late afternoon uh, wherever you are or actually good early morning for some of you uh, in the Far East. Um, welcome to the 85th monthly meeting of the Strongly Sustainable uh, Business Model Group uh, and um, very pleased to have with us today one of the uh, six major projects of members of this group, uh, the Future Fit uh, Business Benchmark. Uh, Alicia Ayers is here with us today and uh, after my brief introductory remarks uh, to set the, the tone, uh, we'll be handing over to Alicia. It's quite late in the evening where Alicia is today, so uh, we'll, we'll forgive any, uh, uh, any challenges that Alicia has uh, to, uh, uh, to, to stay focused. Thank you. <laughs> okay, you're, you're very welcome. Okay, so, um, so we are a group that's exploring how to enable entrepreneurs and established businesses to realize enterprises that choose flourishing as their goal. And that's been the work of our global community uh, since uh, 2012. Uh, I've highlighted this a couple of times already, but I'm so happy about it, I'm gonna highlight it again. So Thomas Wunder, one of our members, uh, is the editor of this new book called Rethinking Strategic Management. Uh, this book has about uh, 16 chapters in it uh, by different uh, authors, uh, including myself and Stephen Davies, as well as uh, about half the chapters are written by other members of this group. And this is uh, science-based, uh, strategic thinking, uh, methodology, justification, business case, uh, etc. Future fit is in here. Uh, the flourishing enterprise strategy design method is in here. The triple layer canvas is in here. Uh, the the um, flourishing business canvas is in here, uh, and much else besides uh, that will help any of you working on strategy. Uh, with uh, organizations around the world take a science-based approach. Uh, highly recommended, that just came out on Friday. Uh, available, I now understand, on Kindle, but you can also uh, buy it from Amazon and uh, also buy it directly from Springer, who is the, who is the publisher. So, um, so we start these meetings with uh, an acknowledgement of our privilege. Uh, this is a recommendation from the Canadian Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, this has been updated to re reflect the fact that we're, we're uh, although physically here in Canada for the meeting, we're also a global audience. So wherever we are today, this is sacred land on which each of us are privileged to be. This land, the nearby lakes and sea, has supported human beings for thousands of years and is rich in history, knowledge and tradition. We're privileged to be the beneficiaries and stewards of all that has come before on behalf of the seven generations to come and indeed beyond. And we invite you to consider in your place how you honor and respect peoples indigenous to your place, including of course, for many of you yourselves. Today, each place around the world is increasingly a home to peoples from across the world, and we're each grateful to have the opportunity to be where we are today. Also a recognition of the physical place that we are sitting in. Uh, we're actually just down the street from uh, this building that you can see in the picture. That's one of the other buildings in the OCAD uh, campus. We're just a little bit down the street and uh, nearer the CN Tower, which you can just see at the left of the picture. And uh, I'd like to ask you a question. Do you know in where you are physically right now, what watershed you're in? Anybody wanna let me know? What water, do they know what watershed they're in? <laughs> All right, so for us in the room, uh, we're sitting on the edge of a watershed known by settlers as Russell Creek. Uh, they, we buried that in the uh, 1870s uh, because we polluted it so badly, so we wanted to hide it from everybody. Um, it definitely has an indigenous name, but we don't know what it is. If anybody does know, please let me know. Um, and obviously uh, the delivery of this session uh, is interdependent with this place, wherever you are. And if you need to visit the bathroom just before or just after, uh, then obviously you're actually using the ecosystem service provided by the watershed um, that you're in. And if you're using the Flourishing Business Canvas, uh, this watershed is a collection of biophysical stocks and solar powered ecosystem services, which you can talk about in the Flourishing Business Canvas and to help you think about the interdependencies of your organization uh, with the, its business model, with its place. 
So uh, we are now 1,650 people globally. I think we've added almost uh, 50 people since last month. Uh, so we're continuing to grow with no advertising budget and no re outreach. It's just people somehow finding us by Googling strongly sustainable. Um, and uh, we are the first, perhaps the only group taking action to undertake enterprise strategy and to do organizational design action research from a micro ecological economic perspective. So these are the, the economists who pay attention to the fact that the economy is inside society, inside the environment. And we are using anticipatory systemic design approaches. So another name for this is action research. So we're actually trying to get out there and do stuff uh, and learn from that experience. But we're taking a very uh, normative approach, a, a goal-based approach that we're trying to reach, help people reach strongly sustainable or flourishing outcomes. Uh, which I just said. So hopefully we get you and you get us and you're part of our tribe and uh, we're, we're happy to have you here. And as I said, what our members are doing is putting into practice and action research uh, the latest ideas. So we offer a global network of possibilities for your education, research, employment, etc. Um, I won't go through the group's goals in detail. Uh, if you want to read uh, more about this, take a look at our wiki, uh, wiki.ssbmg.com slash home slash streams. You'll find out more about the objectives of this group. Um, and all the presentations from all the past meetings are all sitting in our Google Drive, which you can access through drive.ssbmg.com. Presentations are there and the recordings are there as well. Um, the group is evolving. Uh, we're in the process of evolution right now. So we've been in existence since 2012 and we are now uh, as a completely volunteer based organization and we're evolving to become the Flourishing Enterprise Institute plus a continued community of research and practice. So some sort of an evolution of this community. Uh, the idea of the Institute is it's a, a, a global um, uh, a, a, a permanent home for all the action research projects that we're all doing, uh, a think and do tank, and it's the idea is it'll be a planetary network of nodes with the idea that we need to be both respectful of where we are, but also taking into account the fact we're on a single planet, and therefore uh, we need both a, a planetary and a local perspective. Uh, founding forum was held in 2019, uh, and the uh, kickoff um, keynote by Dr. David Cooperider is was our uh, August meeting, uh, so you can watch that video that's now uh, sitting in the Google Drive. Um, the first node has been hosted by Wilfrid Laurier University's uh, Wiesman Center for Engagement and Research in Sustainability, and uh, from the founding forum, we've got another, I would say, three or four uh, locations around the world who are interested in becoming founding nodes of the network, which we're now working on some fundraising in order to move that whole process forward. Um, so we, we contribute to a global uh, movement, uh, both this community and the Flourishing Enterprise Institute. Um, and uh, we call this the Movement for Flourishing Enterprises or the Flourishing Enterprises Movement. Uh, you can see some uh, logos and books, and I should probably add this book to that, uh, uh, to that list of logos as well. Um, so these are all uh, people who either have self-identified with flourishing or an equivalent idea. Um, they may not yet know that they're seen as part of the movement by us, but uh, we're slowly bringing all of these people into, into this big tent uh, of a movement. And uh, we're seeking to bring, out a, a, bring about a world where, as David Cooperider says, enterprises excel, humans flourish, and nature thrives. And of course, this means that we're very much in sync with the UN Sustainable Development Goals, but we're also going beyond the SDGs because while the SDGs are an amazing gift from humanity to ourselves, uh, there are aspects of the US, UN SDGs that are not science-based. Uh, for example, um, goal eight, including economic growth, uh, something that is assumed to be unending uh, on a finite planet is not scientifically uh, feasible. Um, we have multiple collaborative initiatives of our members, um, and this month we're pleased to have one of our members, the FutureFit Business Benchmark, uh, giving us an update on uh, their work. We've had uh, meetings focused on some of the other uh, ones, the six projects, uh, six initiatives of our members, major initiatives uh, also uh, in the past, and will continue to do so in the future. Um, we are also interested in starting additional um, initiatives uh, and there have been some discussions about uh, things to do with product design and also on software tools as well in the past I would say those are still in the early stages of, of being incubated but they are interests of members of the group um, we also make and sustain uh, communities and connection I'm not going to go through this this month but uh, these are some of the uh, places and things that you could go and look at uh, if you want to take part in other events uh, in our in our network 
through this, uh, won't go through this. So the monthly meetings then are, are there for, for sharing. Um, and uh, here's a sample of the last three or four that we've had um, over the last months. And uh, as I said, those are all documented in the wiki and all of the presentations are in the Google Drive. Um, we are currently looking for uh, help to uh, run the group as it currently is and to help evolve the group towards becoming the Institute. I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Tim Poslett, who's sitting to my left, who you can probably see if you, Tim waves, you can see him in the meeting room shot there. Uh, so uh, Tim is a uh, new arrival in Canada from Germany. Uh, his PhD was on serviceization, um, so very much in the, in the product service uh, domain and obviously serviceization being an absolute critical topic uh, in terms of moving away from uh, owning things and having things to uh, thinking about the outputs from the things as being what we really uh, want. Uh, so Tim's going to be working as one of uh, as a community animator for the group over the next year, taking over from uh, Nicole Norris, who was playing that role for the last 12 months. Uh, but we are looking for a second person to uh, work with Tim, to work with me, uh, to uh, help us run the group over the coming 12 months as we um, migrate hopefully into being a funded uh, process uh, funded through the uh, Flourishing Enterprise Institute. Anthony, are you looking for somebody locally or what's your plan for activation on that? It uh, doesn't need to be local, no, can, can be remote. Okay, I've expressed some interest but I haven't heard anything back, just saying. Okay, um, so w that's probably because of the transition to Tim from Nicole. So uh, we'll follow up with you, Laurie. And I, I recognize that we've been rather bad, I've been rather bad about communicating with you. So my bad on, on that front. Um, so, uh, and with all of that background, I'd like to introduce our speaker for this month, uh, Elisa Ayers from the Future Fit uh, Foundation. And I'm sure Alicia will explain Future Fit Foundation versus Future Fit Business, uh, et cetera, in her, uh, talk. So Alicia, welcome and uh, I'll stop my presentation. You can start sharing your slides and uh, you should be able to do that now and uh, it's over to you. All right, However you would like to, uh, to use the next uh, uh, 75 minutes or so. Okay, um, all right. So hopefully everyone can see that now. Um, yeah, do you want to put it in the slide show? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, perfect. There we go. Um, just uh, getting it all ready. So um, thank you for joining today and just uh, or tonight, this morning, wherever you happen to be. Um, and just a few caveats. So first off, this was meant to be Martin Rich who was presenting, um, but he went and scheduled a trip to Asia for two weeks uh, to talk about Future Fit and hopefully grow our community there. Um, so I got the happy job of taking over for him. Um, so just to apologize that um, instead of the co-founder, you're getting the, the ecosystem lead. Um, the other caveat is actually, I feel like Bob could probably do just as good a job of talking about future fit as I could because um, he's been there from the beginning actually since before I joined um, so Bob when I get something wrong feel free to jump in and and, uh, and point out that the history of the timeline is a bit off um, to learn. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, for those of you that don't know, Bob has been really instrumental in, in providing support to Future Fit Foundation from the beginning, as I know many of you on the call have been as well. So just a, a shout out and a thank you. Um, so I'm going to walk you through uh, just sort of what's been happening the last couple of years, actually, um, because as um, Anthony and I had discussed, um, I don't think anyone from Future Fit has presented to the group since before release two, which was probably about three years ago. So there's a lot to catch up on. Um, I'll walk you through a bit about release two in particular, um, just so you're fully caught up. And then I'll dive into um, just everything that's happening this year uh, because we've seen really great growth. It's all very exciting. Um, and I am actually gonna do a quick overview of who we are, what we do, um, just cause I'm not sure you know, who's, who's joining, who's gonna see this later, who may or may not know about us. Um, so apologies if you're already familiar with this, but I won't make the overview to long. So diving in, um, when Jeff and Martin um, first sort of started thinking about Future Fit, um, the biggest idea that came to their head was really that they were looking around and, and 
sort of recognizing the structures in place that business was operating it with wasn't properly valuing society and the environment. So starting out with um, the notion that shareholder value ruled all and that financial returns were all that mattered. Um, you know, over time, companies have sort of started to see the shared value and the triple bottom line, um, the fact that business does touch the environment or society, but even with shared value, you can see that business is not fully, um, you know, sorry, business is not fully, um, sorry, it's a bit late and my brain is going a bit blank here. Um, this is not fully accountable to society and the environment. So this is where the notion of system, system value comes from. The idea that business is wholly accountable and wholly dependent really upon society and the environment that it, that it sort of operates within. So what does future fit mean within that? Um, future fit in particular. So we know what it means to financially break even. Um, but when it comes to the environment and society, you know, how much is enough? Um, Future Fit answers this question by translating system science, which I know is a part of the reason that we're involved with this group. Um, you know, we've used John Rockstrom's parliamentary boundaries. Um, a lot of our work sort of focuses on Kate Rowler's donut economics. Um, and we put that into clear and actionable guidance on what must be done. So for companies, um, you know, there is a, a clear and growing expectation on business to help solve sort of humanity's biggest challenges, particularly since the launch of the SDGs. Um, Future Fit equips companies with information they need to identify how and how much they must change in order to ensure that they are helping rather than hindering our transition to a flourishing future. Um, investors in particular, um, there's growing investor awareness that um, portfolios are vulnerable to systemic risk and there's deep frustration um, throughout today's ESGs um, sort of markets uh, really that ratings and rankings aren't helping and they're focusing on past performance um, rather than current best practices. So what FutureFit is really looking to do is provide consistent comparable forward-looking ESG data that enables investors to identify the companies that are doing the most to respond to today, today's um, biggest risks and emerging opportunities. You can see here the sort of virtual circle that we're trying to achieve. Um, Alicia? Yeah. Could, could you go back one slide? Maybe. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so, so this theory of change has obviously been there since the beginning. Yeah. Um, and I was just wondering, um, in, in practical terms, um, on the investors, and it was always seen as very much a, um, uh, something that investors would request, would be demanding companies produce future fit report, reporting. Um, do you have any stories yet about investors who have started asking uh, for that information from the companies in which they're investing? Um, I do, and I was actually going to share a wee case study later on in the presentation. Okay, perfect. Yeah, perfect. yeah. Okay, great. Um, and then actually when I do that, you can sort of push me a bit and ask specific questions as well, just on the example that I'm going to provide. Perfect, thank you. Okay, great. Um, all right, so I made it through that slide without uh, too much trouble, so that's good. We're on to, you know, we're on to something here. Um, so we see ourselves as uh, unique and useful um, in a world that's sort of fairly crowded with other organizations um, and with other uh, third-party initiatives that are trying to achieve the same kind of change that we are. Um, and when we looked across the spectrum of uh, of other initiatives doing similar work, we saw that they fell into sort of three broad categories of management tools, reporting tools, and system requirements. So just looking at the um, logos there, you can see under societal requirements, we have the planetary boundaries and sustainable development goals. Um, for management tools, you have the ISO frameworks and standards. Um, for reporting tools, uh, CDP, who I actually used to work for, full disclosure. Um, integrated uh, reporting. And then there's a number of organizations that sort of overlap. So science-based targets initiatives, um, B Corp, who we know really well, and you guys obviously know too. And um, we see ourselves as sitting really at the center of this movement. Um, 
in that the business benchmark provides a clear destination to aim for that's grounded in system science. So as you all know, um, is really grounded in the natural step framework. Um, the business benchmark provides a means to guide and assess true progress. So you can assess your break even across all 23 of the break even goals. Um, and we also are working on a way to report meaningful actions in the context of your ambitions. So um, again, this is something that I'll talk about a bit later. Um, but as we seek to launch our pioneers program, part of that is going to be um, enabling companies to report on their progress. For the future. So the way that we're talking about future fit these days is much less of a reporting tool um, and much more of a holistic management tool that really drives um, progress and sort of concrete action by companies. Um, so what is it, you asked, which I'm sure you all know anyway. Um, <clears throat> it's a set of 23 break-even goals with progress indicators. Um, so we have the break even, which is what every company must do. And then we have a way of defining good, which is what every company may do. So this provides a clear destination for business. Um, it's a guide for innovation. So a lot of the stories that we're getting from users now is that actually um, the benchmark is challenging their thinking and challenging um, the way that they go about their business in a way that makes them sort of take all the decisions. And again, I'll come on to that a bit later when I go through one of the case studies of a company that's actually using the benchmark. Um, finally, we see this as a great tool for engagement. So again, the, the anecdotal feedback we get from companies that using the business benchmark internally is that this has been a really um, powerful tool to connect across different business functions. So rather than staying siloed within um, the you know, communications or CSR or you know public affairs department that actually using the business benchmark has enabled our contacts to become sort of experts of their business. It's really quite exciting for us and I think it speaks to the power of the holistic approach of the future fit. Um, all of our goals are matched against the sustainable development goals because um, we recognize that there's a global movement to achieve the SDGs and we're not trying to compete in any way with the framework but rather to show how we align and that actually progress against future fit shows progress against the sustainable development. I think I had all those points there. Um, so taking just a step back, as I mentioned, um, the last time I think Jeff or Martin presented was back uh, when we had just come out with release one. So there have been a lot of updates since then, which is quite exciting. Um, and I'll just start with release two, which I realized is a couple of years ago and maybe a step or two back, but it does help to frame where we are now. Um, so release one, uh, was comprised of two documents. Uh, one was the break-even methodology, and the other was um, a bit of a deep dive into all 21 of the break-even goals. So you'll notice there that I said 21 rather than 23. Um, <clears throat> and it really focused on this notion of what every business must do. Um, so that's that line in the sand that we talk about, and that sort of break-even goal. Um, we focused really heavily on getting that right in the first instance and then in release two um, took on a lot of feedback from early adopters and users of uh, the goals internally um, and made substantial changes. So the release two is actually the first time we started talking about um, positive pursuits. So that's that notion that in addition to what every business must do, that there's also um, things that businesses can do. Um, and by that, things that businesses can do to actually um, drastically improve the current state of society and the environment. So, you know, not all business is a force for bad. Businesses often contribute um, much good to society. And what we wanted to do with the positive pursuits is find a way to reflect um, the good that business does in a holistic way that sort of goes above and beyond um, to your sort of traditional philanthropic reporting. Um, further to that, um, there were a lot of drastic changes actually um, in what we produced and the type of guidance that we produced. So we moved from 21 break-even goals to 23 break-even goals. Um, the two new goals that we added back in November 2017 were procurement and financial assets. Um, 
In the initial release, uh, as I mentioned, we had those two documents. One of them talked about all the goals and how you could measure sort of renewable energy. Um, and then there's a little caveat on, I think, 15 of the goals that said, oh, yeah, and you also need to look at your procurement and how that relates to this goal. The feedback we got from our early adopters was that these caveats were confusing and that actually having a full procurement goal would be a much more powerful tool to engage across the business. Um, recognizing that companies are mutually accountable for the decisions they make within their procurement departments, um, we felt like that procurement goal was fundamental to pull out. Um, further to that, the financial assets goal focuses on sort of the purchasing power in a different way that companies have. So what you'll often find with business, um, and this is separate to just investors, so businesses in general will make investment decisions. Now, if you are a business that is claiming to purchase 100% renewable energy, but your investment team is then um, pumping all of its money into oil and gas, you clearly have a disconnect between what your company is trying to achieve and where you're placing your financial and monetary value. So for us, we felt like the financial assets goal in particular high highlighted uh, almost the disconnect between what company says and what company does and we really tried to pull that out um, in this sort of in this release in particular um, as I mentioned the positive pursuits were released and uh, we've moved on quite a bit in our thinking in sort of how we approach the positive pursuits um, which I'll get into just very quickly um, finally, in this second release, we really focused on providing a much deeper guidance. So in addition to reframing um, the methodology guide, we actually started to produce, we actually produced um, 23 action guides that covered all of the break-even goals. Now, these action guides in particular focused on ambition, action, and assessment because Kendall loves alliteration. Um, so everything has to everything had to start with an A. Um, but what they did was they allowed for us to um, have a resource for the issue experts inside the company. So that was another piece of feedback we got was that the two documents in release one, um, the goal document in particular, it was overwhelming for a generalist, but it wasn't specific enough for an issue expert. Um, so by creating these individual action guides, um, we allowed our benchmark users to be able to go to the procurement department or go to the energy department or go to um, human resources with a simple guide that clearly stated what was expected um, of a company in order to achieve future fitness. Um, Within these guides, we provide uh, background information as to why these issues are important. Um, we've often found that um, just a little bit convincing goes a long way, especially when trying to bring people on board. Um, further to that, we provide sort of guidance on how to get started. So what are those initial questions that you need to ask yourself? Um, really simple things like, you know, if I'm looking at renewable energy, where can I find my bills? Who manages that? Is it the finance department? Because a lot of times it is. Or, you know, am I going to have to go to the factory floor manager? So we've tried to take a step back in every instance to think through, um, you know, who's going to be using these guys? And we've tried to make it as straightforward as possible. So anybody coming to the material um, would be able to access it, would be able to understand the steps they need to take. Um, and we'll be able to share that information internally in a way that's meaningful. Um, further to that sort of guidance, we've also uh, included a way to measure future fitness, providing additional examples. Um, so just sort of uh, silly little examples of Acme Lemonade Co. on how, um, how they would measure their future fitness is just as a way to spur a bit of thinking. So as I mentioned, that was all released too, and that was in um, November of 2017, and obviously we are almost in November of 2019. So our thinking has moved on um, quite a bit since then. Um, and in particular, so we launched release 2.1 um, at the end of April this year. Um, this version, again, focused on further refinements to the action guides, um, and actually, 
incorporated um, guidance around assurance. So you noticed on the previous slide, I hope that assurance was grayed out. That was because it was our ambition to include information on insurance, however, on assurance. However, um, weren't at the point when we published in 2017 to be able to incorporate that. Um, luckily for us, we have a team member called Kevin Horgan, who is a fellow Canadian who is a um, certified accountant who's able to provide a lot of really useful support and actually drafted the assurance section of the guidance documents. Um, so this we think is, is a huge step forward in helping companies prepare for that ultimate um, audit and assurance process. And what the assurance section in particular does is it outlines a way for business to you know, provide an information trail. So a lot of what we're asking companies to collect may not be very familiar to them. They may not have a system or process in place in order to collect data. So the more they can do to create that information trail, um, the better off they will be and the easier it'll be for them to go through an assurance process if and when they decide to do that. Um, so that was a big update in April of this year that was incorporated into all of the break-even goal action guides. Um, we further refined the methodology guide and I'll um, go into that in a moment. Um, the other big update was really around this positive pursuits guide. And again, just really refined our thinking on what it means to um, have a positive impact on how companies can be discussing that on the interactions between positive pursuits and break-even. Um, and sort of what it means to, to, um, to really uh, discuss positive pursuits in a meaningful way. So as mentioned, um, a lot of the thinking that we did this time around was just reframing of the benchmark. Um, so within release two, we talked about uh, four buckets of a future fit society and I'm gonna get them all wrong because it's late at night and we've stopped using that language um, but essentially we've moved away from that that thinking socially you know we do say socially just and uh, my mind's completely gone blank so it's irrelevant and we're gonna move on um, regardless what we have sort of focusing on now is really um, the sort of framework for a future fit society so people have the capacity to lead fulfilling lives our physical presence protects the health and ecosystems of communities that we live in natural resources are managed to safeguard community um, communities animals and ecosystems water is responsibly sourced waste does not exist um, and underpinning all of that are what we've called the drivers so these are things like um, good corporate governance and you know, systems that we put in place in order to really make progress um, and we found that actually this was a much more helpful framing and a much more holistic framing to talk about um, the whole future fit approach and it's really shaped the way that we now talk about um, business impact. So you can see my lovely little grid here. Um, you have your direct impact and your indirect, your positive and your negative impact. So way we started now looking at um, this break even notion. Every business must eliminate its own negative impact. And that's that line in the sand that I keep talking about. We know exactly where the system boundaries are. We know exactly what has to be done. Um, and it's time for business to do that. So I've sort of danced around what these 23 breakthrough goals are, and we'll go into them now. You can see here that we've bucketed everything um, by energy, water, natural resources, pollution, presence, waste, people, and drivers. And again, this was a change from the way that we talked about it within release two. Um, and actually, we felt like this framing perfectly aligned, obviously, with the, um, the properties of the future fit society. So you can see here, people have the capacity and opportunity to lead fulfilling lives. Our physical presence protects the health of ecosystems and communities. Natural resources are managed to safeguard communities. You know, for us, it just felt like a much more natural framing to fully discuss the future fit system. Um, unless there's any sort of any burning questions on the 23 break even goals, I'll sort of keep moving forward um because i think actually the more interesting bit is the pursuits so as i mentioned we did a lot more thinking around um sort of this notion of positive impact 
And I should say as well, when I say me, I mean um, my colleague Astrid Bellingham, who is our development manager, and Jeff Kendall, who really um, are the brains behind the operation, shall we say. They do a lot of the, the sort of deep thinking on this. Um, and Astrid in particular, um, really shaped that first version of the positive pursuit side and, and pushed it into what it is today. So um, just to say that uh, sort of got here by a means of trial and error, but it's quite exciting that we're here now looking at the different ways that companies can positively impact um, society and the environment. So these different notions are all around, uh, are, are sort of all based around the idea that a company can take an action. So there's not a clear defined um, positive pursuit that a company can take. Actually, there's a number of actions they can take that will align with these buckets of energy, water, natural resources, presence. Um, any business can create a positive impact itself to take it forward. So they can, um, you know, provide more renewable energy. Um, so they can set up a solar panel um, on their business. They can add energy into the grid, pretty straightforward. Um, any business can amplify the impact of others. Any business can reduce the negative impact. So if you have like a waste business that is um, you know, taking on changing non-recyclable waste into waste into recyclable waste you know there's so much innovation around this space that with the positive pursuits in particular there's a lot of room for creative thinking and also identifying new ways to approach sort of society challenges um so as i mentioned uh, we have a number of positive pursuit actions 24 in particular um which drives us crazy to no end because we have 23 break-even goals and 24 positive pursuits. So we really wanted to find a way to make it that uh, we had an even number that didn't work out, which is okay. Um, you can see here though that these are really guided around actions again, rather than individual um, sort of like individual um, commandments that a company must meet. Um, there's a lot of room here for creativity, for thinking strategically about how a positive pursuit may um, align with what your business is already doing. And also a lot of room for thinking that actually, you know, you know your business model may not be fit for purpose at the moment, but you know, what taking these positive pursuits could you take away from and actually learn about um and actually change your, your business model for the better just to like, meet some of these positive um, approaches. I'm gonna pause there because that's sort of the release two and two point one in a nutshell. Um and see if there's any questions because I realized that I threw quite a lot of information at you guys. Hi, this is Simon. It's, it's not really a question, it's just a comment to say this is a really useful update because you know I've been following Future Fit for quite a while so it's really handy to understand you know what differences you've made. I really appreciate you going through the different you know the updates and the changes. Great yeah and um, the other thing that I should have said as well at the start of the call is I'm obviously available um, outside of this this meeting. If you do have sort of more specific questions, um, if I'm not the person to answer them, then I can obviously connect you to the right team member. Um, I should have probably explained a bit more about my role, which uh, before I jumped in. Um, so I'm the ecosystem manager and I'm um, heavily involved and responsible for the growth of Future Fit, um, which means that I work with all of our different partnership programs. Um, I've created this strategy uh, alongside Jeff and Martin, and then I'm actually responsible for the of that strategy. So um, what we're gonna sort of move into next is more my area of expertise rather than the benchmark itself. Um, so I hope I did the benchmark justice. But just to say that um, we're always available for sort of specific questions for just a general anyone wants more information um is curious about how they can get involved etc there'll be more information about that um a bit later on in my uh, presentation no that, that's really useful i've just put um a link in the comments section and uh, maria and i trans did a created a portuguese introduction to the future fit benchmark um it's not the whole future fit benchmark document but it was designed to help people in brazil uh find out and discover 
the um, benchmark. So I've just put a link uh, so okay. you can see the actual slides that you know we've been presenting to companies and in our workshops and business courses. It'd be interesting as well um, to connect afterwards because we do have two partners coming on board in Brazil, one in Sao Paulo and one in Rio. So there might be some connections that you can make there. Um, and one in particular is actually translating all of the materials in Portuguese, um, which hopefully will be uh, quite useful for you and for others who are using the benchmark. Yeah, no, that's brilliant to hear. Cheers. Great. Okay, um, so now the uh, exciting bits from my point of view. Um, <clears throat> so I just sort of moved quite quickly um, through that. As mentioned, um, my role is really around uh, developing our partnerships and luckily enough to have uh, several partners on the call. So Bob, who I mentioned already, is one of our accredited partners. And Eric, I think, just joined the Changemaker community, which is also exciting. Um, for us, the whole goal of FutureFit is sort of global update. So everything that we're focusing our energies on now is how do we get the business benchmark into the right hands and how do we enable people, companies, um, consultants, assurers, um, university lecturers to use the benchmark in a way that's going to really drive progress. Um, so to start, um, we had this lovely development council that's been sort of bumbling along in the background um, since the very early days. And these members in particular are sort of the first adopters and the first users of the business benchmark. So when I was talking about all of that lovely feedback we got um, and why we transitioned from release one to release two, it was really because of the the guidance and support that we received from these members. So very notably, um, Nova Nordisk and the Body Shop in particular, who have been by our side from the very beginning, um, and who have always offered a sort of challenging um, approach to, to us to, to really push us and push our thinking, to push the applicability of the benchmark um, and just make it more useful and usable, which um, we owe a great sort of debt of gratitude to. Um, the nice thing as well is actually that we've brought on investor members to the Development Council um, and the aim is uh, in as much as possible to ensure that our corporate members and our investor members are talking um, about what they want and what they need and what they can provide and how that's all can be used. So for our, you know, for all intents and purposes, you know, reporting at the benchmark, um, reporting against the break even goals is important. However, what we need is for investors to understand what that means and we need to understand exactly what investors want and companies need to understand what investors want as well so they can give them the right information. There's too big of a disconnect at the moment between um, what ratings and rankings organizations are saying investors want and what investors actually want which is why we're trying to bring these two groups together to the same table um, and it's been really effective. We have sort of regular annual meetings with these members and um, we're looking to grow this membership as well um, but in over the past couple of years, their input, sort of seeing the two groups um, clash and, and not in a negative way, in a really positive way, has really shaped the direction that we've gone in um, and really led us to, again, think strategically about what we're asking and how we're asking it and, uh, you know, what we can expect going forward. So just to say that this was our first um, sort of partnership program. Um, and has spurred the, the thinking for the many partnership programs that have come to follow. Um, this is where I actually wanted to give just a quick uh, case study. Um, and we've got the investment one to follow. So all that to say is that, it, you know, the benchmark is being used by companies. Um, so the Body Shop and Novo Nordisk in particular have been two great examples for us, um, just in sort of their application of the benchmark. So the Body Shop um, in particular set itself the ambition to become the world's most responsible uh, and truly sustainable company by 2040, which is huge. Um, and it actually chose Future Fit as the most credible and usable approach to underpin that commitment. Um, above is a page sort of this uh, um, Enrich Not Exploit uh, report references, references references future fit as being the body shop's north star um, and since then 
they have started using to benchmark to provide in, uh, guidance for employees. I think the body shop in particular is interesting because of the challenges they've faced um, since being bought by Natura. Um, so I don't know how many of you guys are familiar, but body shop used to be owned by L'Oreal. And when L'Oreal went, they took all of their management processes with them. Um, so the body shop has really had to uh, reassess um, its approach to everything and how it collects information, who holds that information. And they found that the benchmark to be a really useful tool in organizing that approach and organizing that thinking. So again, for us, this is a really great example of how future fit is a management tool and how it's enabling companies to um, streamline their processes and approach um, novo nordisk even more excitingly is um, getting ready to fingers crossed uh, publish their first set of results across all 23 of the beginning goals um, so they've done two years of assessments now and they will be publishing i think the 2018 results um, in November, uh, we do have a date, so be on the lookout, but they still have a, a few sort of um, internal hurdles that they have to get um, crossed off before we can sort of go live and start screaming and shouting about when that's going to happen. So all that to say that we're close and we don't have sort of final authority yet to say when it is, but, but we're hopeful that they'll be publishing their first set of results um, imminently. What's so great about this for us is that it's starting to, um, not only are they the first global company to actually report against the but it also shows the value of the ecosystem in that um, they use a consultancy partner to help them understand their future fitness. And they also used um, a former development council member and now accredited partner, Grant Thornton, to assure that data. Um, so for us, one of the things that we uh, say repeatedly over and over again is that we are not um, consultants. Like we do not ever want to be consultants. We do not want to fill in timesheets. Um, we do not want to work on a project-by-project -like project basis, which is why we are enabling this ecosystem of different users of the benchmark. Um, and this is just a great example of those users uh, working in tandem to release the results. Um, Again, Alicia. Yeah. Uh, um, so we're, um, I, I'm not sure that anybody from Future Fit ever shared the Future uh, the um, uh, Body Shop story when it first came out. I mm. remember seeing videos about it, but I don't think anybody shared it with the group. So if you if you have a moment just to share something in the SSBMG with everybody about the Body Shop, that would be uh, good. Just so we've got access to the materials uh, in the group. And then, uh, obviously, when when Nova, when you can talk about the Nova Nordisk story, uh, again, think about this community as as, a, as an outlet for sharing news um, okay. about what you're doing. That that would be just make a post for LinkedIn group. Uh, and then and then a question um, uh, about this type of work that's been going on here. Um, one of the uh, questions that I sometimes run into when talking about future fitness is um, from a company is. I know I'm not future fit. I'm going to look terrible, um, and I don't want to look terrible. Um, and and that actually stops them mm -hmm. from doing what apparently these companies are doing. So, yeah. what did these companies have that internal discussion? And if they did, how did they get over it? If they didn't, why not? Yeah. So that's part of why. Um, we're not quite ready to hit go on Novo Nordisk just yet. Um, so they are, even as, uh, you know, a standout global leader in their approach to um, these issues, I don't use the word sustainability, um, even as sort of one of the global leaders in their approach to managing environmental and social issues, they have big weaknesses. Uh, and for them to come out and actually highlight where they are challenged um, is a huge step. And so they, they do need uh, approval from, I think it's their board audit committee before they can actually go out with these results. Um, and that's just a conversation that they're having. I think for them, ensuring that the senior management understands that actually it's okay to not look great at this point in time is sort of the biggest hurdle. So for them, it's 
you know, having the confidence to say we're not perfect and this is our plan to be perfect. Um, there's another company actually that we uh, have been working with um, on a slightly different basis and they're based in New Zealand. Um, they came across us from another one of our partners, a guy called Simon Harvey, and I'm not sure if he's part of this network or not, but he is part of the, the Natural Step Network. Um, THL Tourism Holdings Limited uh, is a, as it sort of implies, is a, is a tourism company, and they recently came out with the first fully integrated report that um, indicates their ambition to become future fit. Um, for them, they haven't actually started the process of measurement or implementation, so they don't know what um, their assessment is going to look like, but they've made a commitment that once they've finished that assessment, regardless of how good or bad it looks, that they will be publishing the results. Um, that example in particular, that was really an internal change management process on behalf of the uh, lead there, a really fantastic woman called Saskia, um, who worked tirelessly with her board and with um, sort of the chairman, so both the, the management co and the board to get them to understand that actually future fit is a necessity for them. And it's a, a, um, a, a boost for their business that ensures their longevity rather than um, something that's going to be a drain on their profits. So for they sort of taken the 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 exact opposite approach in that they've come out and said they want to be future fit before they actually know what that means. Um, so there's really two ways to to approach this. I think unfortunately it is just a fact of life that most companies are going to look a bit rubbish when they actually produce the first report. Um, but what we're trying to do with another one of the programs that we're launching is to enable companies to effectively talk about why they are performing the way they're performing and then be able to provide um, structured information on how they want to change that. So I know that's sort of a roundabout answer to your question, but just something that we struggle with and um, are going to continue to struggle with for a little while. Shall be mine. All good. Yes, thank you. That was a that's a good answer, um, and and it is a complicated um, change management. Um, issue and, and I guess it, it also connects to the question about what investors are demanding yeah. and what investors are expecting um, so if, if investors are expecting most people not to be anywhere close to future fitness they're not going to penalize people for admitting something that the investors already know yeah um, but, um, yeah yeah and that's I mean that's part of the conversation that our development council members have so when we have them in a room together, it's the company saying, well, if I come out with this, you know, are you, are you going to, you know, di disinvest? Gosh, my brain is still, is, I'm not functioning at the highest level at the moment. Are you going to take money out of our company? You know, because we've come out that we're 10 years away from being future fit. And with every investor that we've talked to, what they signal is that it's about, it's much more about the intentionality. So, you know, today's, current performance they're already aware of they already understand that you know companies are failing to perform well that actually it's the intent and the signal to intent to improve that means more to them um, so it is it is complicated and obviously that's not going to be every investor so the um example i use with thl i uh, sort of anecdotally i know that some investors called the CEO and were thrilled and others called the CEO and were like, yeah, what is this? What are you doing? You know, this takes your um, focus away from, um, from doing your job, which is earning shareholder returns. So it's going to be a while before everyone is fully bought into the value that FutureFit brings, but at least for the initial ESG impact investors, you know, understanding that the intentionality that the business benchmark provides is really the, the first step getting them to um, fully invest in and start to ask for that, uh, but ask for that uh, future fit data. Okay, 
Um, I'm just going to move on to. Yeah, okay. There's another question in the room. Oh, here. I don't. Uh, sorry. Maybe you'll you'll also get into it in a second. Otherwise, I, I don't want to interrupt for too long. But I just saw the the Maersk logo also on there um, just a few slides ago. And having my background is a bit in logistics, and I know some people at Maersk and so far. I mean, they're the largest container ship uh, operator in the world, and and. Uh, up to just now, they would have been something of the opposite of a future fit business, uh, if you had asked me. So could you provide just a tiny little bit of insight into their journey towards future fitness and, and how much that is even possible for them to, to attain? Yeah, so Maersk is an interesting one. They joined the Development Council um, in February of this year. Uh, and that was aligned with their intent to be um, carbon neutral, so global carbon neutral shipping by, what is it, 20, not 2050, I think it's a bit more ambitious than that, um, 2030. You'll have to fact check that, uh, mm -hmm. you'll have to fact check that goal, but uh, towards the end of last year, they sort of did a massive signal and sea change to it to indicate that actually their ambitions were much greater than they were sort of talking about publicly, um, came out with a load of uh, new commitments. Um, and further to that, the commitments weren't just to make their own shipping carbon free, carbon neutral, but also to enable the entire global shipping industry to address this problem. And through quite a bit of money and research behind it, as far as I understand, um, and are working through this pro problem with the entire shipping industry. So for us, this sort of renewed and refreshed focus on global action um, and cooperation with other industries it felt like they were serious. So part of what we want to achieve with Future Fit is global knowledge and information sharing. So if the company were to pursue this without the intent of you know, transforming an industry, you would sort of question their motives. But we felt like with Marisk in particular that they were genuine in wanting to make a difference and that actually, um, given the type of company they are, this commitment would have, you know, the board would have had to have gone through a lot of due diligence in order to even yeah. sort of publicly state that that was what they were going to be um, pursuing. And we felt like the seriousness of intent aligned with, um, you know, what we were searching for in the development councils. When they said they wanted to join, we were thrilled. Obviously, there's 23 break even goals. So carbon neutrality in their shipping is just one issue that they have to grapple with. Um, with development council members in particular, um, they haven't fully committed to becoming future fit, but they are on a journey to understanding what that means. And going forward, actually, we will be making, we will be asking all development council members to make that commitment to become future fit. So for Maersk and for everybody on that list that you saw, um, from sort of early next year, there will be a sort of formal commitment on their side to pursue future fitness. So we're sort of in a transition phase at the moment, their um, intent is there and we'll see if they get to the point where they actually feel comfortable committing publicly to, to pursuing this. Thanks. That, that's extremely exciting. Yeah. yeah. I think, um, you know, I, I've worked with shipping companies, I've worked with um, oil and gas companies for a long time. Um, and to see the, from a company like Marisk, who is very cautious, um, who's very sort of engineering and uh, data driven, to see them even curious about the benchmark in the first place, I think is a huge signal of their intent, um, which, yeah, if we, can, if we can move them, then we can move mountains, really. Lisa, I'm finding this whole thing fascinating. Congratulations on what you're doing. Um, Novo Nordisk, is it traded on um, public stock market? I believe so, yeah. I would is have there to. Any, uh, is there anything in the plan to educate some of the stock market leaders? Because I can only imagine uh, how exciting and yet terrifying this must be. And I would think that if they educate, if there's some education to the stock market executives, um, it will help offset the media's tendency to look for the most negative things and amplify it? Um, you know, I don't actually know that 
they've taken that into account. So they have done a roadshow with um, their sort of key investors that I know. Um, and they've actually uh, sort of been using the leverage from sort of known investors to get their CFO and other um, C-suite members on board with uh, using FutureFit. But in terms of then actually going out to um, more publicly to the stock exchanges and some of those leaders, I'm not sure that they've actually done that. Um, but it is a really, it, it is a, actually, my wheels, the hamster wheel on my head is turning simply because um, when, Novo do, when Novo goes out publicly with their results, there will obviously be a lot of communications um, on the future fit side. And that's another hat that I wear is uh, managing all of the future fit communications. <laughs> um, so we're creating like a, a plan for Novo at the moment. Um, from our side, but then also from their side as well, and something like that it could be really powerful. So you've just um, you've given me like a little, a little email I think to go to our contact there to to see what she says. Thank you. Yeah. No, thank you. It's brilliant. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Um, as I promised at the beginning, uh, there is a lovely investor example here, and that's with Hermes. Um, so we have been working actually with both sides of Hermes, and I don't know how sort of familiar you may be with um, this organization, but they used to be the um, pension scheme for British telecoms, um, and they've since sort of uh, grown out into uh, two sides of the business. One is EOS, which is equity ownership services, and the other is investment management. But the EOS side of the business is very interesting because basically what they've done is they take a load of money from other investment managers, pension funds, etc., and then they go to companies and they engage with companies on the issues that matter to them. Um, so they have this uh, investor and engagement framework that they use that I've shown here. Um, and they will focus on one or two or two or three core issues with, um, I think at the moment they're working with around 350 companies. Um, but those issues are, are fundamental to that company. So um, I know they worked with um, a big uh, multinational on their cobalt issues. Um, so they really get specific in there and sort of pointing this out in particular because with the EOS side of the business, what we've done is we've actually mapped um, the future business benchmark and the sustainable development goals to these categories that they've shown here. Um, and we're using this mapping to enhance their existing criteria. So, you know, aligning and identifying missing issues. Um, and by seeking to embed future fitness into the stewardship methodology, we intend for them to be able to drive um, improved company behavior. Um, and one of the things that we're working on in particular with this business is we're calling five paths. So if EOS is working with a company on a particular issue and they want to sort of give a company a timeline to improvement, you know, how can they use the future fit break even goals to understand um, not only the industry, but then that company's journey. So that flight path becomes a way for uh, the company that EOS is working with to really measure progress um, and to really start to drive internal change, which is really exciting. Um, on the investment management side, the Impact Opportunities Equity Fund is using um, what we call a health check uh, to understand um, the future fitness of each uh, company within that portfolio. So the Impact Opportunities Equity Fund is one of their more niche funds that focuses on more responsible business. So Novo Nordisk is actually included within that fund and there's a number of other companies that are um, in there as well. Um, I think there's about 45 in total um, of that count. So using this health check, they've gotten a better understanding of um, basically the the most urgent issues on a company by company basis. Um, so the health check itself, and I should know this because I created it, um, it focuses on sort of the urgency of the issue, you know, how important is it to the company? Um, it then looks at 
existing initiatives. Um, so what is the company doing about this issue? And then finally, it sort of, it takes an analysis of those two different approaches and says, okay, so here's the next steps so what the company should be taking to address you across you know, all economy of the breaking rules. So applying this health check methodology on a company by company basis to the fund has given Hermes a, a clear understanding of um, what that performance of the fund looks like in terms of future management. Obviously, it's not a measurement of break-even, but it is um, a deeper understanding of some of where the hotspots and the risks are with each of the companies. And if there's like a larger sort of overriding risk that every company is facing, then they can start to understand exactly how to engage across the portfolio. And if there's common techniques or if there's um, common approaches they can use with companies to um start to sort of maybe push progress and that company so that is um it's quite exciting really because it's one of the first examples we've seen of a company taking one of the tools that we created and starting to apply it to their investment management decisions um i will say another example that's not on here uh, but there is a case study on our website is actually with um a small Danish pension fund called the LD Pensions. And I say small, they're the, the 10th largest in Denmark. So they are not, um, they're not your, was it APGs? Um, that said, they recently came out with a mandate that all future investments um, incorporate some element of the positive pursuits. Um, I'm not a finance expert. So you can get more information on that on our case study site, um, on our case studies page on the website, just to get a clear understanding of what they're doing there. But what that, what that mandate has done is it's forced companies who want to invest or companies who want LD pensions to invest with them to then ask what a positive pursuit is and then get in touch with future fit. Um, so that mandate has started to drive increased um, interest from asset managers and from um, other portfolio managers back into the future fit network, which is um, just another lever that we're seeing being used across the investment community. Okay, I'm gonna move on and we're getting sort of dangerously close to time here. Um, which is great. So for us, um, just to reiterate that the open source model is, um, is critical to us. So all of our core intellectual property can be found um, on our website, on the um, resources page in particular. And it's all downloadable, it's all freely accessible. Anyone can use it um, in their consultancy practices, in their businesses, etc. And this is to encourage as much mass adoption as possible um, for us. And it's also, um, I think it really harkens back to Jeff Kendall's experience in uh, the tech sector and sort of watching how Apple and how um, Android slowly took over with uh, by using freely created and, and freely available um, applications and, and code and software so for him it was like you know we have to be able to give this stuff away for free if we hold on to it nobody's going to be able to use it nobody's going to want it and you know the future fit will die a death uh, die a sort of slow and painful death with no global update which is really what we're trying to see um that said there are a number of resources that are sort of paid for and we'll sort of come on to that very quickly um in terms of acceleration there's a few sort of partnerships that have just launched um, and one in particular that will hopefully be coming soon. So the Change Makers is our most recent resource, um, which I am most excited about. Uh, we launched this on the so, oh sorry. We launched this on the 17th of September. Um, and this is really the lowest barrier to entry way to engage with the future fit and materials and what this space encompasses is is this additional uh future fit learning so as i said all of our core ip is publicly available what we've strived to do with the community is to throw out a bit of 
sort of additional support um, and tools and resources that people will hopefully find interesting as they use the business benchmark. So if you look across the top bar, we have a knowledge base, we have upcoming events, and we have a discussion forum. And um, the knowledge base, we're hosting um, historic webinars. We actually have a future fit proficiency test. And so within this space, there's a lot of additional guidance and resources to take that test. Um, we have additional case studies that are not available on our website that focus on the application of positive pursuits. And um, we have a break even gold cheat sheets, as we've called them. So, again, some of the feedback that we've got from partners using the material is that the action guides are great, but you know, being able to go into a room with something on one page that you know, talks about what a break even goal is, is would be useful as well. So, that's what that cheat sheet is. Um, we have what we've called a workshop in a box. Um, so that's a folder of files that would enable anyone to come to the break even goals fresh and then like run a workshop inside their company or um, on behalf of another company. Um, further to that, we have that company health check that I mentioned that Hermes has actually been using as part of their um, investment approach. There's more resources on there, obviously, and our intention is to continue to um, fill that space with useful and usable um, <laughs> tools, PDFs, videos, um, which is all quite exciting. And I think um, it's really, it's one of these uh, things I've been saying that it was the thing I dreaded the most, and actually it's become the part of my job that I, I love, because um, it's an opportunity to get really creative with the benchmark. Um, and just think about the different ways that people are using it and how we can enable people to um, pick this knowledge up and run with it. Um, because benchmark is hard. There's a lot of, there's a lot there to unpack and we don't expect people to, to be able to just sort of dive into 450 pages of research without sort of needing a bit more support. Alicia, I have a bit of a question. Yeah. Um, so um, I, we're mostly supporting in Calgary right now, like the startup community, uh, micro organizations, helping them get to small and medium sized enterprises. And um, I was talking to Delphi Group because they have an office, actually, they are, they're one of our partners in our space. Yeah. And they're focusing on enterprise uh, level businesses and similar to your talking global businesses. And what we're actually trying to do with the work that we're doing is uh, um, so, uh, I don't know, create the baby steps of the kindergarten version of this for the startup community. Are there any of those resources in here? Um, Halfway in? I was going to say yes and no. Uh, connect with me after this because okay. one of the projects that we're working on um, that complements the benchmark is actually with the Shell Foundation. And what we're doing is we're applying the break even goals and positive pursuits to social enterprises. Right. So yeah, it's a bit more of a lower touch way to start to engage um, SMEs and, and social our, our focus is social enterprise and so, so we're, 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 we have this Rubik's Cube of all the resources that were on that little map where you were in the center and so we're, we're trying to pick out the little pieces of all those things that entrepreneurs can do from the very first ideation stage and weaving those in so that by the time they are an enterprise global business ah, they're already doing it that's yeah. what we're trying to create yeah Okay. No, that's great. Yeah, definitely. Um, definitely connect with me after this, and I can. If there's, not that I shouldn't be selling you on the change maker community, but if there's nothing on there that really works, and I know that there's some information that I can pull out from the Shell Foundation project work in particular, that would be really useful. Thanks. No worries. Um. Yeah. So the other sort of bits within this community um, are upcoming events, and we're uh, hosting regular webinars both with the teacher team and with our ecosystem so we will be having a webinar with um saskia who i mentioned from thl at the beginning of november and then another one um with another partner a lovely guy called sven from nordic sustainability will be um, discussing his work on the benchmark um beginning of december and then we will hopefully have cora and the novo nordisk team um around the time that they launch the uh a full set of results and as I said other future fit team members which for us this is a nice opportunity to start to um, 
talk a bit more about the benchmark because we don't we haven't had a space before other than sort of going to conferences where we can really sort of get into some of the issues and we can start to share some of the knowledge so the event space in particular is um i think a really good way for us to start to connect uh just a bit more actively and proactively with our with our um ecosystem and users and then the the bit that is most daunting and also most exciting is the discussion forum so for us um and for me in particular i manage our uh our sort of general inbox and we get asked sort of the same question about three different ways by three different people on a regular basis um which is great and it shows that people are engaging with the material but what we want is a space for people to ask those questions so everyone can see the answers and so we can start to generate shared learning um we have uh, as i mentioned the development council on the body shop in particular we one of the the contacts there sort of emailed me to say i got about 16 questions about definitions that i'm going to put up there so you'll be sorry uh but actually it's, it's great to see um it's great to see people questioning us and also wanting to understand you know more and also it, it's just a fantastic opportunity for us to share our knowledge too so all that to say is this change maker community is um is fundamental i think for us to be successful in the long term and really driving people to this space um, it's going to take a bit of time but i think um having a thriving sort of environment where every kind of user feels like they are empowered to to use the benchmark is it's fundamental to our long-term long-term success and that notion of scalability um i'm conscious that we only have about 10 minutes left i'm gonna go relatively quickly through the next bit um these two slides in particular are uh focused on our certified professional and accredited partner programs um so as i mentioned with the novo nordisk example um, one of the partners, uh, Grant Thornton, did their assurance. Um, Grant Thornton is an accredited partner, and actually Bob Willard is as well. Um, so what that means is they have provided us with references to attest to their ability to um, provide consulting services, and they've also passed the EP fit proficiency test, um, which is a, a bit of a pill, but it's sort of four modules that test your knowledge on everything future fit um, across the full sort of spectrum of the benchmark. So uh, very exciting. With these partnerships in general. Um, Again, what we're trying to achieve is that use and usability, and we want people to be making money out of the benchmark. We want consultants to be using the benchmark in their services. Um, we want them to be doing almost the hard lifting for us because we don't want to be doing that ourselves. And we feel like the moment we do become a consultant, we lose all credibility and we lose the ability to partner with people who are using this because why wouldn't someone come to the source rather than somebody else? So, all I have to say, um, that's our firm commitment to not provide these services and that's why we've enabled um, accredited partners and certified professionals so there's not a great deal of distinction between the two so a certified professional is somebody who's passed a future fit proficiency test and they can sit with an accredited partner um, so an accredited partner can have up to three certified professionals um, the benefits are access to the change maker community um, online Q&A support, and actually it's, it's a lot more than online Q&A support. Um, I talk with our most of our partners pretty regularly just to check in, tell them what's happening with FutureFit, um, opportunity to shape tools. So within the change maker community, there is a dedicated section for our certified professionals and our accredited partners. Um, so we are about to pre-release a tool to focus on um, hotspot assessments and um, also third party initiatives and sort of a bit more of that alignment between ourselves and other um, organizations. And what we'll be doing is asking for feedback from um, our certified professional and accredited partner members just before we go live with that. So it is a, a great way to sort of tell us what you want and we'll go and, and make it for you. Um, with the accredited partners in particular, they do get their logo on our homepage. Um, and uh, both of those 
partnerships are growing um, very well. So we only launched those in um, May of this year. And so we've been in sort of a heavy recruitment phase trying to, to grow um, uh, just uh, globally, really. We've had really good traction in Australia and New Zealand, um, throughout Europe, a bit in uh, North America. So Delphi is one of our accredited partners. Um, we're doing some great work at the moment, like really, really excited about what they're doing. Um, you know, could be a little bit better on the Yank side, which I am American, so I'm allowed to say that we're a bit rubbish. Um, and yeah, I think, you know, these are, these relationships are obviously a bit more involved than the change maker relationships. Um, there's a lot more close contact with myself and other members of the team. And I see it much more as like, as our partners, as an extension of the future fit team. So um, work very closely with, with most of those folks. And then the final, I think, and most exciting, and apologies for the slide, because there's a lot to read. I think the most exciting, um, program that we are launching so the other two we already launched the most exciting program we're launching at the end of this year is going to be for our future fit pioneers um we hope to launch this the same day as novo nordisk publishes their results because we see a great opportunity for um them to come out and say that they're publishing and us to come out and say that actually they're going to be the first future fit pioneer um, for us, the pioneers is really where we achieve true scale and global adoption. Um, and we've been working on the strategy for a long time, um, just trying to get it right because it is tricky. Uh, companies are, as we've sort of discussed already, um, we understand that companies are going to be reticent to come out and, and sort of say that they're you know, rubbish across a number of goals. So in thinking this through, we've been trying to find ways to enable companies to sort of understand more than just being a bit crap. And actually there's a whole process to understand um, your future fitness and also to start to be able to use this as a management tool. So with Pioneers, we are, um, I'll, I'll pause in just a minute. Let me, uh, there's just one thing to note. Um, with this program in particular, what we are planning is for companies to be able to go through a series of workshops that we will run, um, but then also um, they'll be able to access on their own the change maker community um, over the course of a year or however long it takes them to be fully aware of what break even means, what positive pursuits mean, what business model change means, and how that all sort of will. Um, drive them to improve performance and then hopefully prepare them to publish their results. So a company will not be a pioneer until they've actually published some form of either you know, future fitness across all 23 break even goals or some form of integrated report that indicates their ambition to um, become fit in the future. Um, as I mentioned, those development council members, what we are hoping is that um, now that we've got this uh, program sort of nearly nailed down, that they will actually all to commit, commit to becoming pioneers um, and go through that process with us. And um, it, we've got a few other companies in the bag as well who uh, shall remain nameless, who are um, excited about becoming pioneers in the future. And all I have to say is that um, this is launching in November and um, 2020 is going to be a huge year for us as we really focus on the pioneers in particular and just enabling that ecosystem of um, accredited partners doing the work, um, pushing companies towards becoming pioneers, um, those companies inviting you know the, uh, their colleagues and, and their sort of industry sector peers to join the change breaker community to start to understand what people Means and all of a sudden it becomes a, a beautiful cycle of um, collaboration and cooperation and companies sort of going on the journey. To so I have three minutes left <laughs> um, for Q and A. Uh, so, so to the Pioneers Program, Alicia, that is very exciting uh, news, and um, I, I just wonder: is there a, um, a discussion going on with B Lab? Because one of the things that I and a few other people have noted is that the B Impact Assessment right now 
does not include a statement of intent. Yeah. Uh, uh, it doesn't say it, you, you get your score and then the, there's an implied idea that you should improve that score, but there's no real uh, in, intention. And there's obviously a lot of stuff about the, uh, you know, using business as a force for good. Uh, yeah. But again, nothing to, to talk about end state, um, yeah. which is what fitness does. So any discussion there about, you know, making it easy for B Corps to become pioneers or? You know, it's funny, like we, we obviously know, we know the B Corp guys really well um, and fully support what they're doing. The way we talk about B Corp is B Corp is like a great snapshot for current performance. And then what we want is for companies to apply future fit in terms of future performance. Um, but we haven't actually been discussing with them the notion of the pioneer company and I think that I think there's some really good synergies there um so that's another takeaway for me so it's actually been really helpful I mean I'm I'm, I'm a B, I'm a B Corp and I'm you know yeah. I'd like to be a pioneer so how, how can yeah. we how can we do that and actually several of our development council members are also B Corp so Eileen Fisher um and because mm -hmm. Body Shop was on by the tour they have to achieve B Corp so it's yeah I think I think it's really important for this pathway the pathway for the little guys to become the big guys and the big guys to come into the future and the, these two ends aren't really talking to each other and they, yeah. they don't know where they're going and they don't know how to get there and these people so uh, you're kind of in the middle you're in the middle of that chart so <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna help you as much as I can but I'm gonna leave it to you <laughs> yeah no, that's that's brilliant I appreciate that yeah Other questions, comments in the in the last minute? Uh, I'd just like to say that this this was a really, really good overview that, that you provided, Alicia. That was so helpful. Even for someone that's close to it, the history of the evolution uh, was really, really helpful. Um, I was just thinking that some people might also be interested. You referenced a number of resources and action guides and so on. Yep. Uh, the calculators may be a, a useful resource for folks that are working with companies on this too. Yes. Um, well, yeah, thank you. Well reminded. Thank you. Uh, so one of, um, one publicly available tool that we added to our resources is um, a set of calculators that will help, that can help you to measure your future fitness across all 23 break even goals. So those are on our website um, on the resources page. If you scroll down, you can access all of those for free and it's, um, they're a nice tool to be able to sort of play around and start to get a sense for what future fitness may or may not look like for you or for the company that you're working with or working for. Um, and you can start to really sort of get a sense for some of the nuance of the, the different goals. But that is, yeah, that's a really great resource that I should have mentioned. Hi, Lissia. I just want to uh, do a quick comment. Really appreciate this um, update. Again, it's been really interesting. I've sent you a contact request on LinkedIn. I'll send you a couple of articles which talk about some of our work with Future Fit and um, the uh, future, sorry, the Flourishing Business Canvas in Brazil. Great, perfect. Maybe it was great to connect. And thanks, yeah. for, thanks for today. Of course. No, it was um, easier than I thought it would be considering it's 11 at night. <laughs> 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 well, uh, and uh, with, with, with that, Laurie, I wanted to, uh, with, uh, Alicia, I wanted to thank you very much for taking the time uh, uh, and uh, for sharing with us. As, as I said, you know, we're 1,650 people. It's a big community who are all uh, rooting for future fit success and all uh, interested in understanding how we can apply uh, future fit. So um, as events are happening, as news happens, please just make a post to our LinkedIn group. And when you would like to come back to give us deeper dives into some of these topics, um, you know, don't hesitate to reach out to myself or Tim uh, to, uh, to set that up. And we'd be happy to uh, have another session with you guys. Perfect. Maybe I'll make Martin do it this time. No more. No more. Maybe, maybe, you, maybe you should. And, and, I, and, and I, I will be in London uh, next week and the week after. So I, I haven't reached out yet to try and see whether I might be able to pop by the, the offices and say hi, but I'll, I'll reach out to you on Skype and we'll figure that out. Perfect. Sounds great. Thank you, Anthony. Okay. Thanks everybody. And uh, next month, um, we don't have a, we, we, right now we don't have a meeting next month or organized. Um, and um, we, we may manage to pull a rabbit out of the hat. We may not. 
Uh, but December will um, be either a presentation about uh, uh, this book and some of the work in, in the uh, Rethinking Strategic Management uh, book, or it will be a, an update on the uh, Flourishing uh, Enterprise Institute. And uh, again, we'll, we'll figure that out in, in due course. Okay, um, hopefully see you in a month, if not in two months, and uh, step, keep, keep your eyes peeled to LinkedIn for uh, updates. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. 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 Bye, Michael.